Hello and welcome to Research Tools Video 20 Secure Shell or SSH. My name is Kurt Schwer and this is a video for the UNH Center for Coastal Ocean Mapping Joint Hydrographic Center. And this is a class that's actually being done after the Research Tools class has finished, but there are many more topics yet to be covered that I wasn't able to make it to within the class. So I'll be continuing to create videos as much as I can to fill out more topics that will help you out in your research. So today we're going to talk about how to connect a computer securely in a way that you don't give up your password in the clear across the network because if, if you use things like Telnet and FTP, your password can actually get snagged by the bad guys and it will get snagged eventually. And in that case, they may be able to do bad things to your computers and use them for things that you'd rather they didn't. We'd like to avoid that as much as possible. So again, remember not to run things like Telnet and FTP unless you understand what you're doing and why it's okay. If for some reason you end up having to use them for some reason that uh, lets your password possibly get out there, I suggest you quickly go and change your password through some secure means. So let's go ahead and get started. Um, the first thing is the stuff I'll be showing today is also available for those on Mac and Windows. And if you're a Windows user, Microsoft Windows, you can use tools from SigWin that will install a Linux or Unix-like environment on your Windows computer. You'll then be able to run SSH from a terminal window and we'll look at a command called cron that will actually run commands periodically for you in the background. Okay, so let's get started. And we're on a terminal. Now this is a Ubuntu Linux virtual machine. It's 11.04. So that was released in 2011 in April. And this machine is on my laptop. And I'm going to be working with a remote Linux machine that's a virtual machine at CCOM on a network that unless you're at CCOM you won't be able to, to see. So if you're working with this class and you're not at CCOM, you'll have to find some other virtual machine to connect to to try out these things. It works with uh, any Linux or Mac machine set up to receive remote connections. Talk to your administrator if you need uh, to figure out how to do that. So we'll go ahead and uh, get going on that. So with Secure Shell, we'll do a man-k, which is apropos, and SSH to see what's available on the machine in terms of manual pages, so that you could RTFM. And we have an SSH man page for, this, the, for the main program, and we'll also be looking at, uh, not ask password, but SSH keygen, which will generate our cryptographic keys that we we'll use to do a connection without having to type our password. And then we'll also be using a command called SCP or secure copy. So let's take a look at man SSH. And the secure shell, which is actually open SSH, is what's on most computers today. Uh, it can be very simple, but it can also be quite complicated and you can do some very fancy things that we won't necessarily try today. I encourage you to learn a lot more because SSH can really improve what you're capable of doing with data and managing computers around the globe. Okay, so let's take a look at our machine here. So if we do ls-la to list all files, including the hidden ones, and we say grep for ssh to see if there's anything related to ssh in our home directory, there's not. There's just this less file that we can ignore. And um, once we get going, we're going to have a .ssh directory that's going to start building up information. So let's type hostname to see where we are right now. So we're on the Ubuntu virtual machine. And we're going to SSH or secure shell into the research tools computer at CCOM. So SSH research tools.ccom.nh. Now remember again, ccom.nh is only for those people inside of CCOM. If I press enter, and you're going to start seeing some interesting information about secure shell as we get going here. I'm going to hit control C and try again so that you can actually see what it says. So we did our SSH right here, and it then asked us this question. What's going on is that Secure Shell actually talks to the computer and gets a key for it. <clears throat> that key is a cryptographic identifier for that computer. If that key changes, you're probably talking to a different computer or somebody screwed up the update to the machine, and you might not want to trust that computer. We'll see that more in a little bit. So we can type yes to say this is a new machine that we're willing to trust. Type yes. And now it says that that's been permanently added to the list of known hosts. And then 
This message right here is something we're going to see a fair bit from CECOM. It's a requirement of the government since this computer uh, has government funding is at a state university. It has to have warnings about that you have no right to privacy, etc., etc. So I'll go ahead and type in my password for this account. And I'll press enter. And I'm now logged into a remote computer. And it's uh, as it logs in, it's telling me a little bit about itself. Uh, it's an also a Ubuntu 1104 computer, as seen right up here. And if we type host name, we'll see that this computer is called Research Tools. So we're now on a remote computer. Type who. There's no one else logged in. If we type uptime. We can see this computer has been up for 91 days. So that's great. Now if we type exit, we're back to our original computer host name. So there, there we are back on our virtual machine on our laptop. Now if we do ls-la, pipe that with a vertical bar to grep to search for the string ssh. Dash i is case insensitive on your grep. Press enter. And lo and behold, we have a new directory called .ssh. This directory is super important for SSH, and it's also important that nobody else can read this. Now, typically, if you're just on your laptop by yourself, this wouldn't matter too much. But oftentimes with SSH, you'll be working on computers where many people log in, and you don't want other people to be able to get at your SSH configuration information. So it's important that the other and group flags are all zeroed out in your files permissions. That would be with the chmod command. You could always say man chmod and that will help you change the bits on those files. But what Secure Shell does is if that directory doesn't exist it will create it for you. So let's take a look in there. ls-la.ssh and we have a file called known hosts. Let's take a look at that. ls.ssh known hosts. Now what this is, is this is the keys for each computer that it's keeping track of down the road and it will compare it with these later on. Not very user friendly, but at least you have some sense of what's in there. So Q to quit out of less. And we now have uh, an SSH directory created that we can then put in our cryptographic pair. There's going to be a public key and a private key. The private key is for you. The public key goes elsewhere and it gives you the ability to connect to various places using that key rather than any other type of authentication. And the great thing about public keys is that the public key is only good for uh, for one end of the thing, so you have to have both parts and you can pass around the public key if someone gets a hold of it, it isn't that big of a deal. And you can actually even email somebody your public key, have them installed on the computer, they can then set up a connection so you can log in securely. Very handy. And if we do create that key, you can create it with or without a password. And we're going to create it with a pass without a password so that we can SSH to various places without having to type our password every single time. That's important if it's an automatic job where you might not even be located at the computer when it's going on. So man SSH keygen. And this man page isn't the most fun. It goes through all the details of creating keys. I highly recommend you read it and hopefully you'll get a little bit out of it. It's not very exciting and you probably won't understand a lot of it. Don't worry. We'll go ahead and create our first key and we'll go ahead and say ssh key gen press enter and there are several types of keys. There's RSA and DSA keys. Uh, there's lots of details to that. We'll just go with the default to create a RSA key now it's going to create a file called id underscore rsa as seen right here. We'll press enter and we're going to have no passphrase so empty press enter same thing again press enter. It gives you some little funny image of art. Now if we do a new listing in our ssh directory ls-l.ssh we'll see that there's now two files there's a public key and our private key. So let's take a look at them. Less id rsa oops dot ssh slash and then star. Now what's going to happen is typically you wouldn't want to do something like this video where people could see your your public private key. 
Now after this video is done, I'm going to go ahead and just delete that entire research tools account on that server so that somebody couldn't then use my private side of the key to get into that computer. So let's go ahead and hit enter and we'll take a look at these files. And here's the private key. It's full of lots of data. Don't worry about what's in there, but that's your private uh, cryptographic key. It's very secure, but it's not really meant for you to read, but it is configured such that you can paste this around and work with it is just pure text. It is actually binary encoded data. So we could do a colon n to go to the next file, and this is our public key. It's a little bit more manageable size. And it says where it was generated, so research tools at Ubuntu, and which type of key it is, SSH, RSA, and then some data. So the pair of those together, you can encrypt stuff with the public and you can decrypt it with or with the private and go un unencrypt it with the public. So let's go ahead and we want to copy that over to our server and put it in something called the authorized key. So if you SSH to a machine and your public key is in the authorized keys, you will then be able to get into that computer irrespective of the regular password. So we're going to go ahead and copy that over. So we'll do SCP ID RSA whoops, dot SSH slash ID RSA dot pub to research tools dot ccom dot NH colon. So what this is is a secure copy. It's the same kind of protocol as SSH where it's an encrypted connection between the two machines and it's going to copy a file from our local machine to our remote machine machine. So here's our source file that we're going to copy, so just like the regular CP command. But now we have the ability to specify a computer name and then a colon. So this lets you to copy a file anywhere on the internet that you'd like to copy it that you have permission to. So if we press enter, it's going to give us that same warning again. I'm going to type in my remote password. Press enter, hopefully I get it right. And I didn't. And you get three tries, so we'll see if I can do it here. There we go. If I had done it a third time wrong, it would have just kicked me out. I have to start the command again. The idea of that is to prevent people from doing brute force password tries as fast as possible with a computer program. It slows it down a little bit. They still try anyway. Okay, so now we've copied that over, so we'll do SSH to research tools.ccom.nh and we're going to go set up our authorized keys in the .ssh directory on our remote computer. Okay, so now we're going to SSH to research tools and we're going to work on getting our public key into our SSH setup on the server. So I've logged into the remote computer hostname is research tools. If I take a look around, I've got my id underscore rsa dot pub. However, I don't have an ssh dot ssh directory. I can make one by just ssh to local host and we'll type yes and rather than typing in our password and connecting in locally, which is this is the same machine that, that we're on, we'll hit control C go back to our prompt and that will actually create our .ssh directory with the proper permissions. So we're going to move our id underscore rsa.pub into .ssh but before I do that let's take a look in there. ls-la .ssh and we see that we just have a known host file which is going to have the info for localhost. Now Localhost, if you aren't used to Unix, is just refers to the computer that you're on at any one time. So localhost means a different thing on every single computer. Okay, so we'll do that move command. And we're going to rename it to authorized keys. This is when I hope I spell it right. And ls-la.ssh. And we'll see we have our authorized keys in there. Now if we log out with exit or control D, we're back to our machine locally, host name. So we're back at our Ubuntu virtual machine. And now if we do an SSH to research tools, we'll log in 
and it never asked for my password. It did a cryptographic signature saying, hey, look, I've got the right person. Yep, that's the right person. Okay, let them in. And that way you can do stuff where you're copying files back and forth all the time. You don't have to go crazy trying to type your password every time. Now just make sure you keep that private key secure. That needs to stay as protected as your password. And we'll go ahead and exit out of that. So we've now got everything set up for uh, logging in remotely and pulling off some really neat tricks as we get going with SSH and SCP. So this way you can copy files back and forth, you can log into your remote server, and things are going to go a lot faster. Now there's a couple of config files that you need to know about. You may need to modify them on your local machine or on the remote server, or you may have to have an administrator do that for you. The SSH config is in slash etsy slash SSH. This is for the side making the connection going out. And there's a couple things that you may need to be changing, and the key things are typically the forwarding of X11, that is a graphical user interface forwarding. So you can run commands remotely on the remote computer that require graphics. They can be displayed back on your local machine. And this has been around since way before things like remote desktop, where you can run programs on any particular computer you want and then display them back to wherever they need to go. We won't go into that in this video, but those are very handy to know about. Okay, so let's go ahead and try to use SSH to do some neat tricks. For first off, we're going to just play around with research tools and see what we can do. So we can SSH to researchtools.ccom.nh, but I'm not going to hit enter here. I'm going to end, actually put in a command. So we can type hostname. This will use the SSH protocol to connect to the remote computer, and it will actually run the hostname command and return the results back to us here on the local machine. So if you press enter, we get all of this annoying mess up top. And then we get back that this was running on research tools. So we'll do a quick demo of something that, that might be kind of like what you might actually do with SSH. We'll create a little script that does the disk usage on that server. Maybe you're watching it over time as people use it and you want to make sure that you can graph the usage of that computer and see how much disk space is needed on it for daily use. So we can do SSH to research tools, replace host name. I just hit the up arrow again to do the command history. So we'll do df dash h dot. So that's disk usage. Dash h is human readable. So right here. And dot is the current directory. So wherever it happens to be, which should be our home directory. Press enter and you can see this is as if we are running df on that remote computer and getting it back. If we do a df dash h dot locally, we'll see it looks very different because we're on our local machine and we have just one drive. This is a server with some other setup. And it's got a different size disk. It's got 21 gigabytes using only 2%. So what we can do is we need to first get rid of this annoying message because if this comes through all of our scripts, it's going to drive us crazy. So what we can do is see where it comes from. So it comes from standard error. There's two different streams of text coming out of programs. There's standard output and standard error. Error messages and warnings and whatnot go to standard error, and your regular text goes to standard out. We can grab that with kind of a funky command and redirect standard error to some place that the world does disappear. And there's a special file on Unix machines. It's called dev null, N-U-L-L. -L. And that is a special file that you can send anything you want to that file, and it will just gobble it up and throw it out. It's the great bit bucket in the sky where bytes go to die. And you can send any data you want there and it just magically disappears. So if we say echo hello world, if we redirect that to dev null, nothing happens. It just gone, it's gone and again dev null still looks like the same file sitting there <clears throat> with nothing going on. So if we do our ssh command with our df-h dot and Normally, you're probably used to just the greater than. We can say 2, and 2 is the number reserved for standard error. 1 is standard out. So we can send 2 rather than 1 to our dev null. And if things work out right, we should just see the results of our df. 
So that got rid of all of our warning messages. That'll be handy to be able to do that. And if we want to improve this command a little bit, one, we're gonna, if we're going to be plotting it, we don't want it, the human readable, we want just the machine readable one. And we'll change that to just be the, the root directory. And then we'll pipe it to grep for uh, minus v to get rid of stuff. So dash v is the inverse of what we're looking for. So we want to get rid of mapper. And we also want to get rid of file system. So we'll give it the vertical bar for or inside of a grep command, file system. And now we have a nice little command that doesn't do exactly what I want for some reason. And let's see what's going on. And we need egrep for extended grep. That will probably work a little bit better. There we go. I'm going to make this a little wider. So if we take a look here, we actually have got a nice command that's putting out just the disk usage for that particular directory for slash on that computer. And we can do then move on to the next topic, which is called cron, C-R-O-N, man-k cron. And cron is what's called a daemon. It's a program that runs around in the background and does work without a user being around. It'll run even if you're not logged into the computer, as long as the computer is powered on and going. And there's a couple of things we can do. First, we need to set up our editor. You may have already done this. Export editor, editor equals, and I'm going to make it emacs-nw for no window, so it'll appear right in this terminal when I edit files. And let's take a quick look at the cron. So here are the three relevant entries in the man pages. So we can type man cron and it will talk about the actual program that runs commands for you periodically in the background. And there's two man pages of the same name here, something we haven't seen before in the class. And the number in parentheses is the section of the man page. So we can say man one cron and that'll give us oops man one cron tab. There we go. Will give us the program manual page. And there's actually a cron tab file that's got the setup for that. So if we say five, this will give us the actual documentation on the format of the file that we're creating, including things like how to specify a uh, program to be run yearly, annually, every time the computer reboots, or hourly. Things like that are pretty handy. So all the documentation is there on the computer. And let's go ahead and take a look at our cron tab. Now, on this computer, there are currently no cron tabs for the user. They're actually attached to each person's account. And each person can create their own uh, cron entries that will get run periodically. Dash L is the list the cron file command. So we need to go ahead and create a command that we're going to go ahead and put in. And we can say, cron tab dash e and that will edit our cron tab entry. Now it's got some comments that start with a pound that are giving some examples and we're going to go ahead and create a command for ourselves that will that will work out for creating um, periodic updates of the disk usage and put it into a log file for us. So I'm going to open up the terminal to get ready for what we're doing and we want to be able to grab a timestamp so we can say date will give you the time, but if we're going to be plotting the stuff down the road, we don't really want that date. It's not very useful. We can then tell date to be in UTC because all timestamps should be UTC in my opinion. And we can then say plus, and then we can start giving it format commands. You can read the man page for date to see all, all of the uh, things that you can put in here. So percent Y gives you year, percent M gives you month, percent D for day, T to be the break between the date and the time, and then percent capital H, percent capital M, and then might as well do percent S, that's capital, and then Z for Zulu. If we do that, it's going to print out date and that time. Well, that looks nice and is used by a lot of software tools. When plotting, usually the best thing to do is to do date as uh, the UTC Unix 
timestamps, which is seconds from what's called an epoch, which is 1970. So we can say date uh, plus percent s, and if we add dash dash UTC, you can see that they're actually uh, it is in UTC. So this is the number of seconds since 1970, and that number makes it very easy to plot out uh, and do math with time. So we'll use that as our timestamp, and it's a lot shorter than that. So that's our date command that we're going to want to use in our log file. And let's go ahead and start building up our command. So we might want to do an echo dash n to not put out a new line. The back quote runs a shell script inside of a command. So date plus percent s. So if we just do that, that's going to give us our timestamp. And then after that, we're going to do SSH research tools. And we should really make this very wide. Dot ccom dot nh. And then we're going to run df slash. We're going to redirect standard error to slash dev slash null. And then we're going to egrep minus v. So we're going to get rid of mapper and or or is really the right word to use file system. So if we run that command, you can see that it paused briefly right here as it ran this command locally to get the date and then it went off and got the timestamp. Now we want to be able to redirect that someplace. So what we're going to actually do is we're going to send that to normally you would use a greater than to redirect to a file but we're going to append to a file with two greater thans and then slash home research tools disk dot log. Now I specified it with an absolute path so we don't have to worry about tildes because cron is going to run in a funny environment we just don't want to worry about having to expand too much stuff. Let's go ahead and hit enter see what happens. And it didn't actually write everything to the file so we need to wrap everything inside of here including oh that doesn't look good. Okay I hit control L to redraw. So we put a beginning of a parenthesis at before the echo and an ending parenthesis right before the two greater thans and that will take all of that and make that essentially one command for the shell take the output of that and send it all to the uh, disk log. So if we say cat disk log we have a line that didn't work out quite right followed by a line that was great. Let's go ahead and remove that file disk.log Okay. So now we're clean, ready to go, and now we need to create our cron tab that's going to handle this. So we're going to copy, edit, copy, and edit, paste. So that's our command we're going to run. We do have to watch out for the percents. So uh, I did a control A to jump back to the beginning. Okay, if I put a backslash right before this percent, it'll protect it so that cron doesn't try to fiddle with it. Otherwise, it won't get passed correctly to our command. And now we have to specify the format for when this command is going to get run. So, as you see here, there's sort of hints, minute, hour, day of month, I believe, and day of week. A couple things in there. We're going to try and run it for starters every minute. So, during minutes, we're going to go 0 to 59. And then uh, star means any hour, any day, month, and week. Let's see, make sure I got the right number of stars. One, two, three, four. Okay, good. So if we save this, that should create a cron tab for us. Now notice that it wrote a temporary file, and then it's going to copy that file over to the right table location for the computer to keep track of it. So we'll do Control X, Control C. We've now installed our new cron tab. And if we do a tail minus f var log syslog, you'll see that right here, it, oops, it kept track of the fact that we edited our cron tab for the research tools user account. And if we wait a little bit, we should see a new uh, cron tab entry go into the log file. And if we do an ls-l, we'll see there's no disk log 
there yet. So if we do date, we'll see that we're about to come up on the transition from 122 to 123 date. So we've jumped the minute. If we go back to our log file, we can actually see it recorded running our command. So there it ran this overly complicated command where it printed out the date stamp and then it SSH'd over to research tools. It got rid of the warning message right in here. It removed the mapper and file system and then it wrote it to this log file. So hopefully that made sense to you because if you've taken the other classes in the series I'll explain some of those uh, bash basics. If we do an ls-l now we see we have a disk log file right here. So tail minus f disk log and we now have our first entry in our disk usage. So if somebody were to copy a giant file onto the research tools computer right now, our disk usage would change. So if we SSH over to research tools, ccom.nh, if we type last and pipe less, we'll see that it's connected in a few times and now we've got entries coming in with different times and our disk usage is right there. So if we were to copy a file, I'm not going to do that right now, but if we pulled in a big file here, we could uh, then cause something to take up disk space and we'd be able to track it here and we'd see these numbers changing. Okay, so that's the basics of cron. Um, there's a lot to it and you can spend time going through what's going on and it will um, take a little while to get really good at it but it's very handy and it can run stuff all the time and we can then change stuff to be how we need it to be so we can say control C I'll do a quick edit of the cron tab so if we say cron tab dash E for edit there's lots of things you can tweak but if we go down the bottom here we can say slash 5 and that will run it from minutes 0 to 59 every 5 minutes. Save that exit and now it has a new cron tab where it will only run every 5 minutes. It's very handy and I use cron jobs well they're running all the time for me taking care of sensor data copying files from one place to another handling things like Every time I get an email from the U.S. Coast Guard Healy, I actually have a cron job that every hour goes through and builds the latest visualization for the ship. All right, so I'd like to show you one last thing with SSH before I let you go, and that's to how to use it from inside of Emacs to be able to edit remote files, especially if you're far away from the computer where the file lives. If you SSH to a remote computer, it takes time for every key press that you hit to go back out to that computer do the change and then come back to you and that can be really annoying when those delays get long and it just gets very hard to work with remote files efficiently. It's very doable but it's also a lot easier to be working locally with Emacs and working with a file. So I'm going to try here to use a tool called Tramp inside of Emacs and Tramp is a system for using SSH and it can also use other protocols to grab files on different computers, edit them locally, and every time you hit save it will use SSH to go back to that other computer. And the key thing is that if you have to type your password every time you hit save you're gonna go crazy. I certainly can't take that. So having your SSH key set up makes it fairly easy to do. So let's see if this will work. Control X, Control F, and now I can say slash SSH colon, so now it says loading tramp, we now have that module running and we can say research tools.ccom.nh colon and then we'll just say dot for the current working directory when we get to there so that should be our home directory. If I press enter it says we're waiting for remote shell, found the remote shell and I'm now editing the directory on the remote machine just like I could do dured on the current computer. So I can create a file called hello world txt hi there and if I save this control X control s you can see that it's writing the file out across the disk and if we SSH to research tools.ccom.nh we can do an ls-ltr sort by time not that we have anything to sort 
and we have a file called hello world and if we say host name we can see that that is our research tools computer that's remote from our laptop so we're editing a file on a remote computer and uh, it just works so again the command is um, find file control X control F or you can do it from the menu up top and then slash SSH colon the host name is right here then a colon and then where what you'd like to edit so this path right here is just the path like you normally would use on a local computer and that's all there is to tramp uh, it takes a little bit if you have problems with it it doesn't give you very good error messages so I suggest starting over from scratch and trying again or finding someone who's comfortable with tramp to give get you through the first little bits but it's definitely an amazing tool for doing editing of files and managing data on remote computers such that especially if you're going over satellite links trying to edit files externally is a royal pain thank you for joining me and that's research tools 20